Hello folks, thanks for tuning in to the latest episode of Vinyl and Vision. Here we are with episode 108. Today's very special guest is Doug Maduki. Uh, Doug is the guitarist for a band called Quits from Denver, Colorado. Uh, they currently have just released a brand new album called Feeling It on, uh, excuse me if I slaughter this, Sleeping Giant Glossolalia? Gloss Glossolalia. Glossolalia? I am having a hell of a time with that name. Also had a hell of a time with a lot of this. Um, to, <laughs> this show is, is becoming increasingly difficult as the episodes go on. Uh, this one, difficult because, uh, again, I am tackling a record that uh, has no, no understandable lyrics. Uh, one, one song is sung in a different language. You'll hear about that soon enough. Uh, the other songs have vocals but no lyrics so again nothing to go off of but the album in discussion tonight is Sonny Sherlock's Black Woman from 1969 so no voc no lyrics are needed for this album uh, I think that that's what Doug and I come to the conclusion of uh, over the course of our conversation it's a hard record to talk about Doug was afraid to talk about it I was afraid to talk about it I think that some of the reasonings that I had to be weary of trying to have a conversation about this album were not necessarily the same as Doug's, though I do think we did share a commonality in at least one aspect of how it's difficult. So let's tackle that now, just to get it right out there in the open. Um, this album is by Sonny Chirac. It's called Black Woman, released in 1969. So I, I am not uh, a, a historian by any means uh, for American history nor music history, but um, I think that it's kind of clear to s to see that though there is a lack of lyrics in in the album Black Woman, it is an incredibly poignant, powerful piece that is pretty much trying to shed light on the idea of racial injustice and um, maybe r uh, racial tensions in America at that time in 1969. And unfortunately, it seems that it's still, you know, uh, completely relevant to uh, today as well. So, it's a heavy record. It's a heavy record for that for that reason. Um, and performance-wise, it's incredibly uh, impressive as well. Uh, it's just, if you don't know this album, you should definitely listen to it. And if you do, or when you do, um, be aware it's going to be hard to listen to. There are going to be moments. Uh, that maybe sonically it pushes your, presses your limitations, but on a uh, very kind of on a humanly level, like on, a, on an artistic and kind of like emotional level, uh, it, this record can fuck you up. It can just floor you. I mean, it, it's it's kind of devastating, but kind of incredibly beautiful at the same time. So I think that's what. Doug and I were trying to come to the conclusion of over the course of this discussion. So we were kind of trying to wrap our brains around and uh, verbalize in a, in a tangible way, which was a little difficult. But I think we kind of got there, and if not, I'm kind of just dropping that right here in the beginning just so that everyone's on the same page. So um, Doug is in the band Quits uh, from Denver, Colorado. Their new record is out currently. It's available everywhere that you can stream music. Um, but we also, of course, encourage you to uh, purchase it. Uh, we will provide links in the show notes to the Bandcamp pages where it is available. And uh, I do encourage you also to please go listen to, if not buy, Sonny Shrock's Black Woman album as well. I will provide a link to at least one digital platform for it so that you can listen to that as well. Um, do it. By all means, it will change your life in one way or another. I can kind of guarantee that. Uh, thank you very much, folks, for tuning in. Uh, we very much appreciate everyone's uh, support. Um, one of the things we ask that you do is please do all the things you do with the internet, like, share, subscribe, comment, rate, review. Uh, all of those things, they really help us out. And if you care to help us out in a financial way, you can always visit our website, psychicstatic.net, and uh, make a purchase there at any point. For anything, anything on the website that's available to purchase uh, goes towards funding our show, and we really appreciate it. Thank you very much, folks. Enjoy. Hello, Doug. So uh, what's going on, man? How, how are you doing? 
I'm doing good. How are you doing? Doing okay. Yeah. So, so tell me about the store first and foremost. I mean, you're in a record store right now. Uh, you work there, Rax Tracks Records. You said I worked here for a long, long time. I worked here since early '90s. Okay. Uh, although I did take a few years off to move to Pittsburgh. I'm sorry. I'm just grabbing a drink while sure. we do this. But no uh, yeah, I worked here since the early 90s. Took a few years off, five, six, seven or something like that, and moved to Pittsburgh. And then I thought that I liked Denver a lot. So I moved back to Denver and the owners here are super cool dudes. Some of the coolest guys, they kick-started Denver's punk scene for sure. And maybe <laughs> early enough to be there at the beginning of the whole punk explosion. They're really cool dudes. Dwayne Davis and uh, Dave Stidmans. Hmm. And they just let me come on back and do whatever I wanted. And... uh the store is rad. It's one of the best record stores in the country, man. Cool, man. Well, I hope to visit some point. You know, I, I mean, I love, I love a good record store. Obviously, could stay at my place. Okay, cool, man. In Denver, huh? Yep. All right. Yeah. Um. No, I, we should just get right into this because I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, take yep. any 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 more time of yours than I need to. But um. So, let's start yeah. with your history, if you don't mind. So, um, where did you grow up? Well, I, I grew up in Chicago, uh, was born there, moved to the suburbs. My parents moved to the suburbs where I spent my formative years learning stuff, spent some time in DeKalb and Chicago after that, and then moved to Denver when I think I was 20 years old, I think right before my 21st birthday oh okay and we're uh to play with a band okay the Fel Butts was the name of the band back then uh what was the name i didn't catch it felt pilots felt pilots still okay them, and actually they, they were a jangle pop band i think back then 1990 we were called slowcore Kind and, of like uh, Low or like... Uh... Yes, we were buddies with Low for sure. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, some of them talk to them more, but I still see Zach or I still will say something to Zach online every once in a while, but it was distressing to hear about Mimi from Low to be sure. Yeah. That, yeah. Those were the days when I moved here, the early days when they were just starting to call stuff slow core. Hmm. Wow, is that, that's something I haven't even heard about in a long time. I haven't even thought about it. Sure. Slow core. <laughs> right? Codeine. Who else? Yeah. Codeine and low. That was it. <laughs> that sounds like about right. My my bloody Valentine, kind of? Nah. Kind of? Not nah. really? That nah. shoegaze? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so now, growing up in Chicago, uh, you came from a home, parents in the house? Both parents in the house, sure. Yeah. And they were good parents. They, yeah, I had, our basement was the punker basement. You know, uh, we had the graffiti on the walls and the fishnets hanging from the ceiling and the, all the punker flyers. And I was not too much of a problem child, but my parents were good enough to let any problem child get rid of their problems in our basement you know it, it was it was a good place to grow up and learn your shit you know yeah yeah and so they were supportive of you kind of learning music and kind of just using yeah, it as your your outlet years but for sure yeah they let me and some weirdos definitely play weirdo music in the basement for sure yeah oh, okay and then what age were you starting to play weirdo music 13 i mean i i think that when i jumped in we started a band just to start a band mm -hmm. and we dove right into the weirdo shit we nobody knew how to play we just I maybe drew, drew straws to see who got which instrument and 
just because we didn't know what we were doing, I think it was fairly weird. It was the hardcore days. Yeah. And I sure we fancied ourselves a hardcore band. Okay. But uh it was never quite hardcore. It was always something funnier or weirder or stupider than hardcore okay that's cool so 13 so what did you end up playing like what what, what straw did you draw i drew the bass okay which was fun not as hard to learn as the guitar and uh there's some seven inches out there uh, yeah just silly silly pre-high school even punk music and it was fun but we were sort of friends with some o- older folks mm-hmm. not too okay. much older or not not weirdly older but we were able to pretty early on as a kid play start playing like the college circuit and some weird bars you know it was made it 80s and there was hardcore bars or punker bars and stuff around niche bars around and as a young kid i was able to go and experience that kind of shit play yeah cool uh, crazy crazy shows as a young kid and it blew my mind you know sort of ruined for this life forever you know (laughs) yep we're ruined okay really it really did like i don't because you dove too deep is that why i just liked it too much it's too much fun you just do whatever you wanted and also uh, maybe those days of punk music which that's the scene i was involved in was definitely the punk scene Mm -hmm. but those days were weirder like punk didn't mean anything back then it meant whatever you wanted it to mean and going and playing those shows as a little kid to older people where people were drinking beers and smoking and knew more about music than me but they were all very accepting of me it was just awesome yeah that's great well so what was uh, what was music like in the house in the house growing up yeah what were you hearing what were you listening to it was Chicago in the early eight, late seventies, early eighties, mid eighties, and it was f- the Chicago radio uh, dial was full of classic rock stations, which meant a little something different maybe than it does today. Not really, same classic rock, just less U two, but that's mm-hmm. what I grew up on is the Who and. Pink Floyd and the Rolling Stones and uh, yeah, what have you, you know, that's what I gravitated towards. There was pop music always floating through the scene. I, cause I just listened to music, mm-hmm. but I definitely gravitated more towards stuff like the kinks or that kind of stuff, you know, uh, yeah. okay. sort of like looking back on it, even then I, I look at that stuff that I was listening to as a kid and taping off the radio onto cassettes, like proto punky, you know, the kinks were trashy, trashy rock, you know, the Rolling Stones were trashy rock. It it definitely garage adjacent rock. Yeah. Yeah. But so the, so the radio was your, your main influence point. Sure. Oh, yeah, you know, I had a little, I had a brother two years older than me who was never too hip, but hip enough to point me out to a few cool things. But, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, heck, man, my dad was cool. My dad was a weirdo. That's great. Who, he, <laughs> gave, he was not a weirdo, but he gave me, as a very young kid, he would show up occasionally with a record and say, here's the Velvet Underground. I think Ooh. you're going to like this or yeah. here's Bob Marley. I think you're going to like this or here's the 13th floor elevators. You might like this. He did not know those bands. He did not really? like bands. And as I became more engulfed in those scenes, he was so mad that I might be on drugs 
and I want to say, Dad, you gave me the Velvet Underground record, man. Stop <laughs> gaslighting me. Yeah, you gave me the song with heroin all over it. I don't know. That's not my problem. <laughs> Sold me the heroin. Right? <laughs> but, no, but he was very cool and very supportive of that, you know. And yeah, like I say, up and down through the years, more or less supportive, but definitely gave me uh, an, an area to do that in. Uh, they just re released Stop Making Sense in the theaters. Yeah. And, uh, my mom and dad dropped me off when that was originally released. I don't know how, when, what, what year that was, but I was a young kid okay. and they just dropped me off in the middle of Chicago and said, go watch this movie. Wait. And so why, why, why were they giving you this stuff though? Like you're saying that they weren't fans of it. Why were they like, you should get into this. Like they would listen to Eric Clapton or whatever popular Joe Cocker, Fucking, okay. like, uh, what was that? Barbara Streisand, lots of dumb shit. Johnny sure. Mathis. Yeah. They, but there Crap. was, there, yes, sure. <laughs> I like some of that stuff nowadays. That's fine. Uh, a little bit, yeah, here and there. All right. Always music. In that, there was always a turntable in the house there, with good, loud speakers and always music. And I don't know if they just thought, like, I was a kid and they saw my weirdo friends. And so they were just being cool. I, I suppose is all they were doing, you know? Yeah. And I don't know where my dad even would have heard of the Velvet Underground, to be honest. I literally have no idea. All right. This is something you got to ask him at some point. That'd be really good to know. <laughs> I guess it would be. You're right. Well, because how, how old were you when he gave it to you? Good like sixth grade or something like that yeah that's like, fucking young man that's crazy I, like, like i do remember that transition going from sixth grade to seventh grade and making the conscious decision i'm punk now like, yeah and that like i don't know why i made that decision and it was me and a friend mike dixon uh and that wasn't a thing that you did back then and when we showed up to junior high first day of school everybody was like what the fuck are you why is your hair spiky why like why are you wearing a leather jacket like that kind of stupid stuff but it was before that that yeah. my dad handed me bob marley or velvet underground and stuff like that he was wild he worked he was a salesman that worked around chicago and he was cool that way. He'd stop and he'd do his work and stop at a record store and buy me a record. Or he'd stop at a pawn shop and buy me a, an acoustic guitar or something like that. He, That's like, fucking crazy. That's awesome. Right? God, you know, yeah, man. Uh, don't make me cry about my dad because he's I'm not sorry. the best. But, geez, he was a cool, he was cool sometimes, man. Yeah, no, it sounds it. I mean, look, I'm a dad. I got two kids. He's and, not and I dad or anything. Good, he's a, good. He's still around and we still talk every week and he's still a pretty cool dude. That's why you should ask him, like, where the fuck did you get those records, man? <laughs> that's awesome. So that's a really cool introduction to like some pretty groundbreaking music. Uh, now, I asked you on here to speak about a record that was important to you and kind of, you know, influential to you, maybe helps you or kind of helped shape what you do. And you chose Sonny Sherrock's Black Woman. Yes, I did. And I've been thinking since I chose it, who that's a heady record to choose, man. I don't like. Yeah. Sure it's, is. There's a lot of weight behind record, and I'm not sure I can speak to how important that record is. Well, it, it sure was important. Yeah. Okay. Well, then tell me about that. How? How? Like, when did you first come across it? Well, later in life. Sure. I'm guessing mid '90s. Okay. So I was already an adult. I had already been a fixture and involved with a lot of music bands, 
music, music, but that not only music, like growing up through music, but then getting more and more involved in we- weird music. Oh, okay. Uh, outsider <laughs> music. Sure. Uh, lots of noise, rock, lots of industrial music, just lots of weird music. But somewhere in the mid 90s, late 90s, I heard that album. And I think I was at a low point in my own musical journey, like tired of it and not understanding what you could do with it. Hmm. I don't know who showed it to me, but it blew my fucking mind, man. Like, yeah. geez, this talking about it is is emotional because it was something I'd never heard. It was something I had heard. There was lots of bands playing scronky guitar. There was lots of bands doing free jazz, but there was something about that record that opened up like a, another dimension like it doesn't all have to be ugly or it doesn't all have to be aggressive you can play this ugly aggressive music and there can okay. be utter beauty and joy involved in it yeah yeah look i was just listening to it i was i just went out for a little bit in the city and came back and on the way home back home i'm in the car with my son who's 15 and i was just like this is what i'm talking about tonight let's put it on so i put it on in the car and by the time we got to the last song man he was just like i was feeling it and he like he just called it out to me he was just like uh i don't know if we can keep on listening to this like <laughs> oh, he's so happy man i was so scared to talk about this record yeah it means a lot and it is it's beautiful it's beautiful it's it's gut wrenching it's fucking it's wrenching yeah and a... he didn't do that out of thin air there are some people doing that before but he it's like a pure there was people attempting to do it and he did just a pure expression of noise as joy and beauty and pain it was awesome it was right and i play it all the fucking time all the fucking time and even some of my weirdo friends that like weirdo music they roll their eyes I, a lot of people still don't get it so i'm glad that you and your son got it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i was having a moment man i was just like i was getting choked up i was just like yeah okay i know we should probably turn this off <laughs> <laughs> yeah no uh it 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 meant a lot and when people roll their eyes at it to me i don't know if it was that immediate feeling or if it was that or living with it for so long now hmm. I, that i can't understand how people don't get that feeling that you got from it that oh, i yeah. still get. right right like today i listened to it at work with all my buddies and coworkers, and that's exactly what we talked about was that gut wrenching feeling of just pure emotional outlet. Sure. And you're talking about that record with a bunch of record store workers. So you yep. got the biggest heads in the business. Like, <laughs> Yep. And a lot of those guys are that I worked with today are in some weirdo shit. I bet. A couple of yeah. jazz bows, a couple of, yeah, just weirdos, straight up weirdos. And uh, yeah, it was it was fun talking about it with them. Yeah. Okay. Not, not as fun as now. <laughs> no, I don't know how weird you are, man. No, I'm plenty. I'm plenty weird, man. I love it. I um, but you know, but this is like you said, it's a heavy record, and this is kind of, this has got a serious amount of weight to it. Um, I've never been a big jazz person. I mean, I, I have experimented with it for sure. And, and I do appreciate a lot of it. This is, this is a weird one, you know, um, free jazz from 69. I was afraid to talk about this record a little bit is because I'm not the biggest jazz guy. I, yes, I like a lot of free jazz, but I like a lot of specific free jazz. Okay. That's and cool. it's, and it's got to hit a certain note for me. So even this 
record, Sonny Schrock's Black Woman, was something beyond that for me. Like mm. I had listened to free jazz a lot and, and liked it, found it the perfect offshoot of the weirder end of punk music that I was delving into. And growing up in Chicago was Chicago was known as like the coast had hardcore Chicago had art punk yeah. in those days. And I definitely gravitated much more towards the art punk scene. And then that led me into free jazz. This was something beyond all of that. Like I knew it was free jazz, but it, it was something else, you know, it was uh pure expression. Like it, not even experimenting at this point. He was just, they just knew what they were doing. They laid down like a beautiful album of the ugliest music you could possibly come up with and somehow made it beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, like, I think a lot of jazz has those elements, right? A lot of jazz has a lot of like pretty and melodic moments, but then they, they kind of devolves into a lot of like kind of noisier stuff, kind of things that don't seem very, uh, maybe atonal, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, th yeah, but, but there, there's so much fucking going on with this record now. So you said, just to go back to what you were saying, you said you were scared to talk about this record. Like why, why, were you scared to talk about this record? Well, it's a free jazz record. And yeah. I'm not a jazz bow. Like I say, I okay. like a lot of it and listen to a lot of it, but I would never say I'm knowledgeable enough to discuss jazz. Oh, okay. All right. So it's just because uh, you're not like a serious I jazz. I don't know the depth of what all those guys were doing. But it also, this is a specific record that mm -hmm. speaks of an experience that I, I can't ever talk about. It's called Black One. Right, right. And, uh, like, you can hear why it's called Black One right. in in the music. But oh, yeah. I, I can't talk about that. Like, I don't, but that's why I love it so much, I think, is it speaks of a very specific struggle hmm. that I will always be a part of, but somehow it made me a part of that. Okay. All right. I, I can appreciate that. And, and, and I actually have more to touch on that later, but um, there's one thing like, so I didn't know this record when you chose it. So I had to get into it and well, I, I like it. Man. I, I do. Said, I do like it. I do like it, man. Thank you. Thank you. You turned me on to this and it's like, it's, it's going to be a landmark for sure. You know? Um, cause like, just like you, I mean, I'm not a big jazz head. Like I'm not, I don't even know what direction to go into, like as far as jazz is concerned. So if someone can give me a jazz record specifically and say, dig this, I'll be like, okay, this is awesome. Like I can see this is a pretty good, pretty good choice. Um, there's one thing I, I thought about when I first put this on, um, can you tell me if you think there's a difference between free form psychedelic or avant-garde jazz and noise rock? Or is there a similarity? Maybe I should say like, what's what, where is the, the, the thread that kind of puts those two things, but there, of course there's a similarity. And I knew there was some similarity before I heard this record, but I think the joy that I experienced from first the first 10 times I listened to this record, I heard it and became immediately obsessed is the similarities and the realization that what I was doing before had a direct through line to something important people were trying to do before me. Mm. There was people that struggled and failed to do this in so many different ways that made me reconnect with music in a way that like, Oh, it's all of a piece and you don't have to worry about what you're doing. Everybody's making free music is sort of 
how I looked at it at the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so some of those noise rock bands know this shit, know, know the free jazz guys. Sure. And build off of that, which when you're a kid, you don't realize that. But then as you grow up, oh, you realize that's what they're doing. Some of those noise rock bands didn't know that shit, but it didn't matter. Uh, they were doing the same fucking thing. Right. Just go, going about it from a different angle. And I realized sort of the angles that you take are less important to what you're doing as maybe not the end result, but the meaning or something. I don't, I don't quite know where I'm going with that, but it, it, okay. it is all of a piece. Sure. Avant-garde right. music is all of a piece. Yeah. Yeah. For sure, sure. Um, so let me, let me ask you this. Uh, what, like, what do you think you pulled away from this musically? Like, as far as like, you know, to, to your craft, you're the guitar player for, for your band quits, like guitar wise, do you think you pulled something from this? And, and if so, do you do you know what it is? 100%. And I mean, I was already doing some of that shit. And I wasn't always a noise rocker guy. Mm -hmm. I played, like I said, in a jingle pop band. Sure. I played in some synth bands. I played in... But hearing him play specifically, I, I was already well on my way to trying to do what he does but hearing somebody do it in such a such a shocking way like such a loose but focused way like and in a different genre in jazz made me realize that no you don't i i don't have to worry about that shit anymore and yeah, I let my, I just let it, let it go, man. And this, I just played the scrunk and in quits. We're not doing Sonny Chirac stuff, but there's plenty of just letting the guitar play itself. Uh, mm. Finding like, where do my, the guitar tells me where the fingers go or the song tells me where the noise, what noises I should make. And there's plenty of that in quits where you're just letting the song dictate what noises you should make. Okay. I, I, I hear that. Um, because there, there's two guitars in your band, right? So uh, yeah. Lucius plays guitar as well, but are you the lead guitar? I don't know if we've ever gone bothered to figure that out he okay. sings guitar or he sings so since he's singing and has to be bothered by that i do get the chance to play sort of counter melodies to whatever the song is doing okay and in quits there's a lot of in the guitar parts that i play there's a lot of dissonance just on purpose Mm -hmm. less free than Sonny was, but definitely trying to bring in that dissonance. And then I can't help, but let it resolve into sort of the scrunk that invited. He made me knowledgeable. of. You, you can sure. do that with guitar. You can play. You don't have to put your fingers anywhere. You can just make noises and that can be the song. And that right. is, that's what I do a lot of. Okay. Yeah. And, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like, like, cause I've been listening to your record, the, the new one, feeling it. And, um, I was just trying to figure out which guitar you may have been, or like, you know, if, if, if what you were doing is kind of like the first guitar I can hear, you know, it's usually, it's a little hard to tell. I wish I could say, but Luke is a great guitar player mm -hmm. and, we've played together for a long time. We played in a band about 20 years ago. Oh, maybe not that long, maybe that long ago. Uh, we started playing together again because we sort of naturally hook up with our guitars, our guitars 
circle sure. around each other and we're able to make weird sounds together that maybe we don't make apart you know sure yeah you have symbiosis maybe yeah 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 okay that's great i mean you know i i just figured it would be hard for me to figure out between i can't tell which guitar is which really <clears throat> and, uh, and not knowing you guys i mean i, I would never be able to tell it starts out with me playing a, a counter melody which maybe sounds like a lead but i think i would call a counter melody but then it very quickly gets undercut or overtaken or added to by luke's cool guitars and all of a sudden you can't tell what guitar is what and so yeah. it, i i know it because we recorded it but <clears throat> to try and tell you like what guitar is what it's usually me playing those counter melodies on top but it's not always luke definitely comes in with yeah. some very cool parts okay yeah because i mean i just you know listening to the record i know that like maybe even the first song specifically i feel like has a lot of like guitar parts in it that i have felt like were kind it so sounded like they kind of like were derived from from the playing that sonny shirak is doing on on this record you know a little bit there's a lot of that in me and the band is definitely open to exploring all that shit and then once we go into that it's very easy to get sort of lost into making our guitar sound sort of ugly you know sure. and yeah. I, don't, I don't mean ugly and i mean ugly in a specific way you know like letting those guitars just get get out there and sure. do what they're doing you know yeah no I, I i can i can relate i can understand that maybe not everybody else can but i think i know what you mean um so I was asking you about like, you know, what you think you, you may have pulled away from this music, you know, uh, uh, it, like kind of inspiration wise, because, um, I found this interview, uh, that, uh, Ben Ratliff did with Sonny Chirac and he asked him a question, uh, what he says is, so you mean to say that your musical thoughts actually come as tenor saxophone notes? And Sonny Chirac's That's response was, I, I hear the tenor, man, those cats were just the best. Because, you know, he was an aspiring sax player, but he couldn't play the sax because uh, he uh, his asthma. That is 100% uh, uh, also inspirational to me. And I sort of look on myself that way. I did play saxophone in a free jazz band. Oh, okay. Not good at it, but was fun as shit to do. Okay. With some of the guys from Friends Forever, if anybody ever remembers that band name they were great you could watch their documentary uh but you can make your guitar sound even though it sounds like a guitar it's making the noises that a different instrument can play and us on black woman especially what is the last song i forget what the last song is called for willie i think it might be called no no no. that's uh that's blind willie the last song is a uh, portrait of linda in three colors all black uh, uh, blind willie though is okay just solo sunny Chirac, and you can actually hear him trying to blow the notes on saxophone <laughs> It's be, it's awesome, man. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. He really thought he was a saxophone player. And that is inspiring to me that you can shred like Albert Eiler. Yeah, yeah. On the guitar, you can be a saxophone player. You can be a trombone player. You know, that was a big thing growing up in punk was I was a huge Minutemen fan as a kid. Okay. And reading interviews with those guys and mike watt saying like oh i heard albert eiler and i thought it was a hardcore i just thought he was another hardcore band uh that's yeah. awesome it's yeah. it's all the same and to hear like to learn that sonny Chirac thinks he's a saxophone player right is it's inspiring and freeing to me you can do yeah. whatever the fuck you want on the guitar you know yeah, man. No, I hear you. Well, let me ask you this based on that that uh, quote I just read to you. Um, do you think you hear in guitar or do you hear in another instrument? 
like I we talked about a little bit earlier, I drew bass as a high school kid. Mm-hmm. And I think I hear a lot still in bass. And I've definitely opened my self up on purpose to hear it, the guitar as a different instrument. But I realize it's a guitar. <laughs> like I don't I don't know what else to say about that. But I've opened my mind up. When I'm writing songs, they turn into quit songs. And I've been in different bands, less avant-garde, more avant-garde, definitely more avant-garde than this, or definitely poppier than this. This is its own quits is its own thing. But I when I'm writing songs for it i think i'm writing a throbbing gristle song or i think i'm writing a sunny shrock song Hmm. you know it comes out as quits but in my head i think it's hamburger lady by throbbing gristle or i think it's peanut by sunny shrock or what you know like and i'm okay that it doesn't sound like that at the end in my mind that's still what it fucking sounds like is Einstein's any know about. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so look, we're gonna get into the album. I'm gonna try to do track by track. Uh this album is only five songs long, which is great for me. Um, incredibly challenging because not only was it a free jazz album, but it's mostly instrumental. Uh yeah, there's there's vocals. A lot, man. What's that? She sings a lot. Oh yeah, no, there's there's vocals. I mean, there's no lyrics. So that is that was a little bit of a tricky part for for my analysis of the song. But I mean, like you were saying earlier, man, I mean, you feel it. You just you just hear it like it doesn't need well, words necessarily. I'm a little nervous getting into it track by track. OK, why? Because it it's mean it. It's just a piece to me. The whole thing is a piece to me. And it's just one long song that you hear her singing i know it's not singing i know she's not saying words but to me she's saying words sure and so, well it like, conveys it conveys a feeling you know i mean so you don't need the words no yeah so and and i and i get what you mean i mean you know i understand that the, the album is a piece really um but there it's it's there's a there's certainly a heavy message in here there's there's i, I don't know if i would necessarily call it a theme but it there's i mean look the fucking album is called black woman oh, black woman <laughs> and I, like that's what it's about right it was released in 1969 yep so i mean like you know uh, like timeline wise you know uh his history historically speaking i mean this is a poignant piece of like you know um so i say it again folk jazz that's sort of what I, like 69 to 71 hmm. those free jazz guys were maybe listening to some folk and letting i don't I, you're, i'm like eddie gale or albert eiler they're still way the fuck out there mm-hmm. but there's a a definite influence of folk music in in there um, sure sure yeah well it's storytelling kind of you know sure yeah um well, so okay, so the the first song on on the album is called Black Woman, so it's the title track. Uh, what I have from it here is uh, written by Marcus J. Moore, uh, writing for the New York Times. Uh, he included it. He included the album on his list of fifteen essential Black liberation jazz tracks. And uh, so, what he writes is uh, writing that the title track quote was meant to convey the paralyzing stress felt by Black women every day in this country. For much of this song, Chirac's wife emits primal screams as the intensity of Sonny's rapid guitar chords grow more riotous. The track might be jarring, but it effectively captures the pain of being treated as subhuman. That's kind of what you were saying earlier, right? It is. But I also think maybe that's not enough for that fucking song, man. That's a killer fucking song. And I think though the album charts a maybe the journey of a black woman that song charts everything that someone might have to go through 
in that particular time in that particular era there's yeah. it like it goes from beauty and love and peace to being scared to mm-hmm. horror to anger to be, like back to peace and love and acceptance and like that song says a fucking lot in five minutes or whatever seven minutes however long it is yeah five minutes 16 seconds um now your your description of the song is accurate but it also encapsulates the whole record just like you were saying like about this quote that i read to you i mean it's really a description of essentially the whole record you know um but i have to ask you about this song i mean like do you relate to this statement in any way yeah or how how do you relate to it i said i'm a little nervous to talk about this is because i have no authority to speak on the experience of black women right or black woman but there was something they made it universal and that's maybe what i grew to love after my first exposure to it it made (laughs) it made me feel what she was feeling you Mm -hmm. know and i think everybody can feel that and when maybe i was first listening to it i thought oh i'm a black woman like i get this shit i get this shit and of course i don't fucking get that shit right but i get what it felt like to be like ostracized and outsidered you know like i don't know just poor uh trashy little kid that never fit in anywhere and never Mm -hmm. could get anywhere and just being an outsider and looked down on and it you get it like there's there's beauty and you don't have to fucking let that shit get you down right you can just so so you did you you are relating to it you are relating to this music sent you can just be what you are and live through that struggle and find the beauty in that struggle i love i love love that aspect of it relating to that album which i shouldn't be able to relate to maybe well i mean that's the beauty of music man i mean is that like you know like you have to find your 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 little piece of it that you can kind of relate to because if you don't make that any kind of relation and put your hooks into it in some way i mean it's not going to resonate with you and it's also maybe why that's so good is they they were able to do that they were as a band as a band not just sunny and linda but all those other guys that like the piano Mm -hmm. in that song the bass in that song the drums in that song are intense the drums in that song are beautiful and express just as much emotion i think as linda schrock is expressing sure sure yeah um Look, let's move on to the next song, uh, Peanut. Mm. What do you know about this song? Anything? Nothing. Okay. Except that sometimes I wonder if it might be Sonny Chirac's uh, pet name for Linda. That's all I can come up with is because I... it's a beautiful fucking song. Yeah. And I think it might be a love song to his wife. Yeah. Well, you know what? I have a theory. So in the research, I found out that uh, Peanut was the nickname of a uh, black woman named Mamie Johnson. All right. So Mamie Johnson was one of three women to play in the Negro League and the only woman to take the mound as pitcher. Holy shit. Yeah. Real. Yeah. And so she was nicknamed Peanut because she was tiny. She was like five foot three. She was like, it's still Peanut of a girl. Whoa, you're blowing yeah. my mind. I did not know that. And it makes me love it even more, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, it's so, um, so keeping with the theme of Black woman being the theme of the album, essentially, I mean, uh, here's this Black woman who is overcoming, you know, social injustices and, and, and racial uh, prejudice and becoming one of the uh, first women and, and premier woman to, to, like, 
play in the in the Negro League in the fifties. It speaks to the theme of the album and mm-hmm. the title of the album, and. I was content to think that that was just, <clears throat> pardon me, his wife's nickname. And I thought that was beautiful enough. The fact that he's writing songs about all black women, about someone I've never heard of before. And right. he deemed that enough to write an ode, ode to her. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it makes it even better for me. Like, yeah. He's literally, it's full of fucking love. It's full of love, man. It's full of love and, and admiration for the black woman. Because I mean, like who struggles more? Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, look, it's it's a political statement and, and it's a, certainly a period piece. I mean, I think that there's a lot of people that struggle these days, but I mean, black women have it pretty fucking hard. You know, I mean, women will say in general, women have it hard. Completely agree with that. Um, so if you keep on adding on the 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 minorities to that, uh that that like label right so women have it women have it hard you add black women on top of that makes it worse you add like black uh homosexual woman out on top of that and fucking even worse you know you just kind of keep on narrowing it down to like the 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 dregs the all male already discriminated baseball league that's Mm -hmm. that's uh yeah like that's an important statement that he's making. He's I think so. Yeah. Writing love letter to the downtrodden, which I think is where I relate to it. Not the downtrodden, but a love letter to uh, the outsiders. Yeah. The, yeah. The outsiders. It's a love letter to outsiders. Yeah. And that's where definitely where I connect with it. Right. Well, like you said, it's about all black women. It's not just like the one black woman. I mean, like Linda, Linda Chirac is is... also about her, but I think you're, it's also about all black women. In, In this album, Linda is carrying the weight of generations of black women through her lyrical performance or her through her vocal performance, you know, like that's what it is. And that's what's so fucking powerful is that you like you just feel like anything that you know about history, like whether you're a history buff or not, like you fucking know that they had struggle, you know, from from day one to now, you know, and that's the fucking weight that that this whole album carries and it's carried through through her voice. And sort of what I love about it, and maybe when we get to different songs, we might talk about it, but that is the overwhelming sensation of the album. But there are moments of, in the music and in her singing, there's moments of utter tranquility or beauty or Mm -hmm. peace or acceptance. Like, or joy. Yeah. Or like where it's, life isn't all a fucking struggle, man. Yeah, no. There's there's beauty to it. Or do you struggle? It's still fucking beautiful, you know? Right. Absolutely. Look, so I gotta ask you a question about this song Peanut. Um, from what I told you uh about, you know, this song, and this is this is a complete hypo- hypothesis. I, I have nothing to corroborate that this is what it is about, but it seems essentially, you know, being an ode to, to this woman uh nicknamed Peanut, who uh you know, who who overcame a lot of uh social injustice. Um I think I think you took the the name of your new album feeling it from a similar scenario of of injustice and and other human atrocities is is that right it was sort of a general sense of disillusionment i think feeling it. it this record just because of when we lived through was a particular we lived through the pandemic we were doing this through the pandemic so that was a part of it but almost a joke part of it we're feeling it we're we're sick with the fucking covid but it also meant we're feeling everything right it sort of meant we're just feeling the same old fucking shit that we've all, all always been feeling but there's new shit that we have to fucking deal with now and we're feeling it. It's all, it's just hard. It's, it's 
just it's hard <laughs> yeah it's feel, feeling everything that is kind of becoming overwhelming so that is definitely an extension of the way that this that this sunny record made me feel and mm-hmm. 100 percent, yes that's what it meant we're feeling fucking everything okay and not also not just the bad we're not just feeling the sick or the fucking cops or the fucking politicians or whatever the fuck we're also feeling the good shit it it all we're feeling it all and having to process that shit you know right okay i hear you man well look let, let's move on to the next song uh by bialero i guess you pronounce it that way bialero bialero all right so this one's weird so it's it's labeled as traditional i i, I really don't i don't know where this song comes from really i think it's an old french song and bailero by by la it means dance. dance yep and uh it's in reference to a dance okay that they're performing is what right. i believe that's all that's all that's just what I think, knowing my little bit of Spanish <laughs> or Portuguese, I believe that's what Bailero is. They're referring to a dance. I've right. not heard the original song. I might have checked it out once or twice throughout the years, but I don't know the original. Okay. Ne- neither do I. But uh, I did find this about this online. Uh, so I found this on songtell.com. So this is like nothing to, to, to uh, put any stakes in. Okay. I mean, this is like as a matter of fact, this this quote was generated by AI. All right. All right. So it's so doing now to, AI interviews. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just 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 take it with a grain of salt. Just but um, but so Bialero by Sonny Chirac is a unique and enigmatic song that transcends traditional language barriers through its use of an ancient, I can't even pronounce this word, ancient uh Akitan language, Asitan. It's O C C I T A N. I don't know. I don't, I'm not familiar with this. I probably should have looked it up. Yep. <laughs> I haven't gone this deep in my re listening, but. Right, right. So the yeah. lyrics, I mean, so actually, I, I saw that the, the lyrics, like if I listen to music on Apple Music for the most part, and so you can actually listen, you can look at the lyrics along with the song as it plays. And this has lyrics printed. So there are lyrics for this song, and it is in a different language. Oh, in a different language. Can yeah, yeah. You, are, is that printed in a different language? Yeah, yeah. It's all rented. It's all written out, and it's it's a different language. I can't read it. I have no other, no fucking idea what it means. But what so, language? what's that? Tell what language? I can't tell what language. But so, but based on this, it's saying it's Asitan or Akitan. I don't know how to pronounce this. But so anyway, so going on with this quote, it says that the lyrics translated into English depict a pastoral scene referring to a shepherd, uh, quote, uh, pastre, that's the guy's name, I guess, uh, and his flock. So uh, through its repetitive refrain and rhythmic structure, the song presents a rich tapestry of emotions and imagery, inviting listeners to delve into its hidden depths. Let's see. So overall... um, through the use of evocative imagery, timeless language, and repetitive refrain, the song creates a ca- captivating atmosphere reminiscent of an idyllic pastoral world. The shepherd's role as caretaker for the land and his flock reflects the sim- symbiotic relationship between humans and nature. I almost wish I didn't know that because it like it's it's perfect <laughs> and it fits perfectly as the third song as they've already struggled so much in those first two songs. And now they're going out and saying like, it's all, it's all good, man. It's all. Sure. Pretty. It's all beautiful. It's all mm-hmm. easy. Just take it easy. And <laughs> it's, it's all going to be okay. Right. That's what that song sounds like to me. And now hearing what it actually means sort of sounds like that's what they're saying is like yeah i mean kind of like just getting back to nature you know just kind of like look just just kind of maybe whatever the 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 pressures and the the stresses that we feel um you know 
get back to nature and get back to a, a happier kind of like easier time, right? Yeah, but also in the context of the album itself, more means like bla- the black woman of the title is mm-hmm. saying it's all all right, man. Yeah. Like, okay. Like yeah. we can we can live through this shit. We can we can do this. It, it's not all pain and struggle. It's all it's we can live our fucking lives and be happy. Right. Okay. I I I can agree with that. But um, based on what I told you and kind of like this this uh, you know, if the song in in fact is is a relationship or at least describing the the uh, you know the relationship between humans and nature. Um, being from Denver or at least being in Denver currently, uh, like, do you have a relationship with nature? Oh, sure. Sure. A little less these days, but of course, like, that's why you moved to Denver. Uh, right. (laughs) Denver's exploded. (laughs) A lot of quits music deals with the unfortunate explosion in population or uh urban growth that colorado and denver is experiencing but that's why you moved to denver is because you can't help but notice it here it, mm-hmm. it's it's an overwhelming here uh the mountains are always looming to the west you know the sunset is always a brilliant red over the west it's Hmm. 20 minutes and half an hour to get to mountains where you think this is the deepest mountain that must exist but it's only a half an hour away from denver you know Uh, it's sort of forces the connection of nature on so you kind of have to love it if you're living there. I think so. I think that maybe, and maybe, I mean, I moved here from Chicago on purpose because of that. Oh, okay. And so maybe I'm a little more open to it, but it's, it's prevalent. And so it's growing up in Chicago. You don't notice it as much in Denver. It's just all around you it's it's always there right okay all right well look, let's move on we we only got a couple more to go all right <laughs> uh blind willie so i we talked i talked about this one before right can't get over it man i can't get over hearing him play his guitar thinking that he's a saxophone player he's right getting it in and I don't, I think it's a tribute to a blues guy. I don't know if it is or not, but he's sure. blowing his heart out. He's right. blowing his heart out as hard as he can, man. Right, right. All right, well, look, this is what I have about it. And I'm. And then I have a pretty uh, involved question for you afterwards. So uh, what I have here, it says, it's what's striking about this version of Blind Willie, ostensibly a tribute to Blind Willie Johnson, but perhaps also Blind Willie McTell. Uh, is Sherrick's audible breathing throughout the piece, pacing his phrases mm-hmm. as a reed player would. So uh, the effect is intimate and mildly unsettling, but entirely part of Sherrock's concept and approach to his instrument. And that was by Matthew Sumera of Trouser Press. Well, I know this much about Sonny Sherrock. He w- wanted to play saxophone i i don't know who he heard maybe coltrane or Eiler mm-hmm. or something like that and he wanted to be a saxophone player right but he had asthma and couldn't play the saxophone so he tried to play his guitar as though it was a saxophone which fine you can say that all you want but to hear him f- fucking do it on a song right play his guitar and try to breathe the parts through his guitar is killer to me. It's, it's awesome. Right. Well, look, let, let me ask you this. Um, is there anything uh, you have noticed or maybe been told is unique about your playing um, 
possibly being derived from previous habits or skills, kind of like what we're talking about, like Sonny, you know, kind of being inspired by saxophone, but not being able to play it and kind of influencing his, his playing. Particularly me, no. Nobody talks about my guitar playing. I, I There's some people that will say some stuff here or there. I, I don't think I'm on any kind of scale where people might be talking about that. Mm -hmm. But what do but you think? I don't. I think the guitar can be anything, and I think I realized that early on. But living with this album for so long made me realize the guitar can be anything. The guitar can be a drum. The guitar can be a saxophone. The guitar can be a synthesizer. The guitar can be a garbage truck. You know, the guitar could be a hammer or a, a pillow. You know, it could be anything you want it to be, whatever you want it to make it sound like. Just make mm -hmm. that noise. It's not that hard. Okay. And as far as being known for guitar playing around these parts, I think people think that I'm a pretty weird guitar player and they'll never express it in the way that we're expressing now. But that's the way I think of guitar is it can be the, anything. It could be the wind. It could be the street. It can be a guitar. It could be right. whatever the fuck you want it to be. Okay. And uh, that's how I go into every single song that I ever write. All right. Cool, man. That sounds cool, man. That sounds fucking awesome really <laughs> um all right moving on to the last song portrait of linda in three colors all black <laughs> oh i know man i'm fucking dying this song kills me it, it kills me it's it beautiful fucking, right this is this is the culmination of everything er everything we were talking about everything that we expressed as far as like what this album kind of like like expresses details it's fucking all in here it's all this song. It's all for this song, really. And it, it's a love song. He writes it right there in the title. Yep. It's a love song, but it's so much more than a love song, you know? Well, it's a piece of art, like just kind of like, like an artist would say, like a portrait of. This is a portrait of Linda. Yeah. And, th and, and now, musically speaking, it's in three parts, you know? But then, of course, he has to kind of add his little, little uh, all black kind of connection <laughs> to it. Because oh. I mean, like it's it's in three parts, but they're all black. They're like all black. like whatever you whatever you're taking from this, if you're thinking it's positive, you think it's happy, whatever. Because there is some of that in there. It's all black. Don't forget, it's black. <laughs> right, exactly. Which is part of the beauty of that album. When you get to the end of it and you realize all black, and maybe you're not a part of that, but you come to realize the beauty of that statement that he's making. Mm. That... Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I got this really long fucking drawn out thing describing kind of all three parts. I, I kind of don't want to get into that. I think we, we, we think we're very familiar with the song. Uh, we, we know what it is. We know how it goes. Um, there's a quote here. Oh, right, right. Okay. So we have to, I have to address this. So, um, of all this shit that I have here, it's like it's really it's really focusing on Linda's vocals, right? So she returns wailing, uh, a, a keening note, attempting to match the trumpet in power, surpass it in height, but she keeps falling just short, never quite hitting that the note that will resolve resolve the chord. As she continues to sing, the notes grow more ragged and exhausted, and her voice cracks, sobs, shakes. At last, she is merely moaning, grumbling, muttering then silence. The third section is instrumental, guitar, piano, and drums raving out, out to the end of time. The song ends on a fade out. For all we know, they're still playing. That's a quote from Jonathan Bogart from One Week, One Band uh, blog. <clears throat> so based on this definition of the singing performance, I'm, I'm curious if this is also a sonic timeline of the life of a black woman condensed into a few excruciating minutes. Oh, well, of course, of course it is. Yeah. 
I, I, I don't know what else to say because the whole album is that. But yeah, that song is particularly that. Yeah. Yeah, this song is particularly that. And for all we know, they might still be playing, man. Uh, yeah. That's great. I've never never heard that quote and I, I don't I don't know what Sonny Sharp was thinking, you know. I don't I don't mm-hmm. know. No, I know. I don't either. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about tonight is complete, complete speculation. You know, there's no hard facts here, but I mean, I think we can certainly feel uh, what what he must have been trying to intend. The beauty of music is it's all, uh, you know, interpretation. It's uh, it's what you what whatever you want to pull out of it, essentially. So um, let me just ask you this in closing. Are you consciously aware of or is it your objective to try to bring discomfort to an audience? That's yes, that's a huge fucking thing is to bring discomfort to the audience. And I think I've been more explicit about it in the past, even in a band with Luke, that is the singer of this band of quits. Yep. We were in bands that were did that much more explicitly, but it's not. 100% 100% our goal anymore, but there's a lot of staring at the audience. There's a lot of uh, dissonance. There's a lot of atonality. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of confrontation feedback. There's less confrontation these days. There's yeah. just letting that uncomfortableness hang. Okay is more there used to be confrontation now there's like the notes sound wrong or the song goes on too long or the song stops too abruptly or Mm -hmm. they're staring a little too intensely at one person in the audience or that kind of shit where it's yeah tension tension and uncomfortableness that I think should be part of it. Look, I'm not a black woman and I didn't live through fucking the hardest shit in the whole world, but everybody lives through hard shit. And I think that should be part of going to see my band, at least maybe any band. Maybe when you go see Taylor Swift, you should be uncomfortable for a little bit. I don't know. I've never seen Taylor Swift, but when I, when you see me, I think, or when you see my band, I hope you're uncomfortable for a little while. Okay, cool, I, man. I, I do, yeah, I really think that's important. Sure. I mean, noise rock in general, I mean, I think that, that it kind of is par for the course. Uh, I don't think anyone that is a fan of noise rock uh, would necessarily go out to a noise rock show and not expect uh, not expect to be a little kind of jarred a little bit you know by something i mean that's that's kind of that, that's it man look i gotta say thank you for choosing this record this has been uh i'm uh, so glad you loved it and i'm so glad that you fucking researched it and knew so much about it and it was so fun talking to you about it really yeah I man thank you love it so much i i try to talk about it with people all the time and they're like jog on motherfucker <laughs> so it's good it, it was fun to talk about how important this fucking record is man i think it is i think it is and then you know i hope that we reach more people with it and uh more people will give it a shot and get it yeah i hope but also i hope that they give quits a shot um feeling it is the new album when's it coming out it is out last friday oh so it already came out, out. It came out last Friday, and uh, on Sleeping Giant Glass Lately, home of Peter Bratzman, who is a 60s German free jazz player who played with Sonny Chirac. I'm honored to be on a label with uh, a lineage that goes straight back to Sonny Chirac and the free jazz lineage of the mid 60s that's awesome man i'm actually honored to do it peter brockman just died a month or so ago but i'm sorry that sucks uh, gosh 
they were in a awesome Peter Brotsman and Sonny Chirac were in an 80s metal band that you should check out <laughs> as we leave <laughs> this interview. Okay. Gosh, they're those two giants of free jazz were in an awesome metal band called Last Ex Exit. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was I was hearing about it in the research. Yeah. I gotta give it a shot. Good. Cool, man. Well, look, thanks a lot for doing this. Uh thank you so much for the selection. Uh changing my life. Seriously. Oh, god damn. That makes me happy. And James, it was good talking to you, man.